Welcome back to the next episode in Painting Oathsworn. In this episode, we are going to learn to paint fabric and cloth textures using the RV Harbinger. Now, painting cloaks and fabric in general is actually a really technical process as it's important that you understand how light interacts with these specific volumes because it will inform a lot of the position of your highlights. Now, the other thing that's really important about painting fabrics is clean, smooth brush strokes. So I find that using a larger brush than I normally would really helps to reinforce the smoothness of these objects. For this figure, we have chosen an overlay color of magenta. Now magenta is a very warm purple. Now the end result is going to be more of a cold color, but I wanted to create some visual contrast between the warm purple and the colder highlight colors that we'll be using. This is a fantastic figure and I'm really pumped about painting it. So let's get started. So painting fabric and cloth is often a really enjoyable and straightforward process if you keep a couple of elements in mind. So as per normal process, I'm grabbing out all of my base tones here. So that Chimera Violet that I'm now mixing in with the Orchid Light is going to be our first highlight color. So the two things you need to keep in mind with painting fabric and cloth is the number one, the direction of the light. Now, one of the things I've talked about a lot in each of these episodes is zenithal priming and why I've chosen to do it. And I think with painting fabric, it's really, really crucial that you think about the lighting before you make your brush strokes. Now, a normal common approach to painting miniatures which stems from often the way that most of us are introduced to painting miniatures is to highlight the raised areas and shade in the recesses. If you think about how light works, this is not always the correct approach. So what I'm trying to do with this first color is establish each of the light areas that I want to exist on the fabric. And you'll notice that in most cases, I am not really thinking about where the folds are in terms of recesses. I'm thinking about the direction of the light and where I want the highlights to be. Now, this is uh, contrary to a lot of other volumes, the, the way that we normally consider painting these volumes. And this cloak is probably the best example when you are highlighting from a zenithal perspective, and again, I'll come back to different forms of lighting in a later episode, but when you're talking about zenithal light, the recesses, if the light is directly above them, will receive exactly the same amount of light as the raised areas. So you can see on this cloak where there is an area that is a recess, I am actually hitting that with some of our main base coat. This fabric fold, this cowl around the top, however, is a great example of where we do need to leave those recesses in shadow and highlight the raised areas as the light coming from above is going to create shadows in the underneath area. So here I am, I am just making a, a slightly higher value second coat. I am again trying to establish the volumes, the light. And I think when you're painting something where you need it to be smooth, you really want to try and build up several stages of color. The medium that I mix into each of these layers, the Joe Sonia Magic Mix, it certainly does help creating a little bit of a smoother transition between each of these layers. So a medium of any kind will work. It doesn't need to be that specific brand. Citadel makes a pretty accessible one called Lamian Medium. Um, and you'll find the mediums at a lot of craft stores or, or art stores. It's a, a pretty common type of product. What we're looking for the medium is to extend the drying time. We're looking for it to help distribute the pigment a little more evenly than water does. 
and, and how that works is the, the medium is a little bit different consistency to water and it holds the pigments a little bit more firmly, allowing them to be distributed more evenly. So again, where I'm focusing these lights is the key part of this process. There's a lot of big brush strokes, a lot of smooth, long brush strokes. So getting your consistency of paint right is a pretty critical part of painting fabric. I've kept a lot of the footage into this one where you see the color mixtures that I've done. And this is so you can really see exactly how much of a mixture of water and color versus medium I've added to the paint. So already you can start to see each of these specific volumes begin to take shape. And there's a very precise placement of lights on things like this piece of fabric here where we have the leg sticking out. So that leg area has the fold of the fabric a little bit more perpendicular to the ground, which is creating an area where there would be more light than on the lower part of the folds. Again with the cloak, what we're looking for here is deep, long brush strokes where we're adding light to the areas where from a zenithal perspective, light's gonna be hitting. So our third layer, we are using predominantly orchid light. This color is a very cold blue, which will contrast with the warmer color that you see in the violet for the base coat. One of my favorite things to do in miniature painting is play with temperatures, change the temperature between layers, which will help reinforce different contrasts. These placements of these lights are really the foundation of the fabric. If you get the placement of lights wrong, your fabric's not gonna look right and in many cases it will stand out and in a lot of cases you won't even understand why it's standing out it just feels wrong so this is really in an in essence what we're looking for when painting fabric is establishing each of these areas really really precisely we want smooth long brush strokes all of this ties into establishing that fabric is a different texture to other elements on the figure. So if you recall the episode where I talked about leather, we were establishing specific texture based on the use of the item, based on how it's gonna have worn in real life. Well, fabric needs to feel very different to leather. It needs to feel very different to metal, to all of those other elements. When you have a significant change of texture between an element such as skin or fabric, which is a has a tendency to be smoother against those rougher textures from elements like leather or the base, what you're doing is you're helping each of these areas stand out more and create more visual interest across your whole piece. So you can see how painting this cloak is a little different to how you might normally see cloaks be painted. Most of the shadows are at the top of the cloak and that's because the cowl is going to be creating those shadows from above. The lighter areas are being found down the bottom because that's the area that's most uh, prominent and most is going to receive the most light. One thing I've done on this figure, probably more than you've seen in most other paint jobs, is turn the figure upside down to ensure that the brush strokes that I'm getting are really, again, long and smooth and aligned with this volume and what we're trying to establish this volume to look like. The consistency of paint is a big part of creating these nice smooth transitions. If your paint is too dilute, 
you won't get a nice even coverage. But if it's too thick, then you'll have that issue where you don't have a nice soft transition. So finding this balance, finding this right consistency is really difficult for me to describe in this format. Hopefully when you see the mixtures of paint on the palette, you're able to get a bit of a feeling. And I guess looking at the brush itself and looking at how much paint and how much consistency of paint there is on there will help as well. Now this particular surface is one that I often will use an airbrush for. I find the airbrush is fantastic for creating really smooth, soft blends. And for an element like skin or fabric where we are trying to reinforce the softness and the smoothness, an airbrush is really, really great for that. When you don't have access to an airbrush, which I think would probably fall under the majority of people that are watching this video, the way that you achieve that same soft look is through glazing. Now glazing is a, a method that I've talked about in previous episodes and I actually demonstrated in a couple of episodes, but I'll just reinforce in this one that glazing is exactly what an airbrush does. The only difference is the airbrush does in a few seconds what it will take you a lot more time to do with a brush. So the glaze is a really dilute layer of paint. You want to really be very careful with how much paint you have on your brush before you move to the model. Wiping it off on a paper towel is essential for glazing to operate the way that you need it to and you are trying to very, very, very slightly change the texture on the figure. If you are glazing and you are seeing a wholesale change, it means that your paint has not been diluted enough. If you're not seeing any change at all, it probably means your paint is too dilute. You need to be just each layer seeing a very slight change in the consistency of the blends, in the transparency of the color. Very, very, very slight change. And the final thing to think about with glazing is the direction of your brush stroke. As we mix up our next highlight color, what we wanna see from the direction of the brush stroke is really, really careful to ensure that we're moving from a dark area into a light area with our glaze color. When you remove your brush from the model, that very last second of contact will deposit a lot of extra pigments onto the figure. This is capillary action, this is how brushes work, it's pretty normal. If you want to see this in action, grab a dilute paint, put it on a bit of paper, and run your brush across the paper and then lift your brush off. And you'll see that more pigment collects at the end where you remove your brush. So when we're glazing, what we're trying to think about is removing our brush from the model at an area where that extra pigment isn't going to change the color on the figure. So by moving from shadow to light with our glaze, we are depositing a tiny amount of pigment in those areas where we're moving the brush across the model. And as we're removing our brush from the model, we're just leaving pigment in an area where it will not change. So glazing, it's a, it's a fantastic technique. If you are not interested in purchasing an airbrush, it will achieve exactly the same result. It will just take you a little bit longer. There's many videos on glazing. I will link a couple in the description. Uh, one I normally recommend is from a painter called Cujo Painting. So fantastic video. So we're really starting to see a lot of contrast between 
the light areas and the magenta now. We're really starting to establish those lights and it's creating a really interesting look. However, what we are seeing on this fabric is we're losing a lot of intensity of color. Now this is, in a nutshell, the way that I approach painting figures. I want to see a lot of contrast between light and dark, a really big value shift between light and dark. It creates a much more striking appearance on the tabletop when you have this transition from light to dark. However, as I've talked about in previous episodes, losing intensity, losing vibrancy of color is something we don't want to happen. And if we continue to increase the value, increase the contrast on this area, we're going to be left with an almost white looking fabric. So my approach to fixing that is by filtering these layers with a more intense and saturated color. This is sketch and refine is the way that I've described it in the past. But it's also really about over contrasting and then bringing that back. I find that when you have that huge contrast change and then you drop it back using filters, using glazes over the top, it's a much more punchy and interesting finish. So this color is a mixture of orchid light and pastel violet. The term pastel violet should give you a hint as to the fact that it is not going to be an intense and vibrant color. But it does help create that value change I was talking about. One of the things that can be really fun to play with on fabrics is different types of fabrics. So I see this model as wearing something like silk or some sort of expensive fabric. And so that's why I'm doing a lot of long brush strokes and a lot of pretty high value lights. If you have a rougher cloth or a cloth that doesn't have as nice a finish, then you can start to experiment with stippling, with little textures like I've talked about in other episodes, creating a sense of distress on the cloth. Depending on the figure, you know, this might help to reinforce that this is a poorer person or a creature, or it may help to reinforce that this person has a lot of money or is very well to do. Different elements respond to light and texture differently. In many ways, miniature painting is about establishing that on the figure for the viewer to see. So we're moving into our last highlights now, and this is with pure pastel violet. These ones are not going to be taking up the majority of the volume. We are instead focusing them on the raised areas, on those key areas where I want to see light. As I said, trying to make this look a little bit more like an expensive piece of fabric, like silk or something like that, means we're going to have lots more light glimmering and glinting off this fabric. Again, paying attention to the consistency of the paint here. This is not an ultra dilute color. I think many painters starting out in their journey go one way in the wrong direction. They'll either over dilute because they think that super dilute colors are the way that you achieve smooth blends, which is to some extent correct, but it is also a way that you lose intensity of color and pigment. Other painters will not dilute enough and will have big, thick, globby blends. Finding that medium, finding that balance is how we improve. 
our end result. So I think just making sure that you've got a really clear purpose for each of your light placements will really help your final result with fabric. You can see that on these long lapel type surfaces, I'm adding light on the raised area and then creating some shape around the edges with the pastel violet to just reinforce the light running off the edges. On the back of the, of the cloak, we're looking at the edges, we're looking at key highlight areas and overall the sensation of light. So let's move into the airbrush now. Now, I haven't really talked much about glazing with my airbrush. I've seen it, I've done a little bit in some of the later episodes, but what I want to show here is all we're doing with this airbrush is softening these transitions. And you can see exactly how dilute my paint is through the airbrush. You can see exactly where I'm placing these lights. And what we're looking for here is a gradual softening of each of these transitions. The airbrush is a fantastic tool for doing this. As I talked about earlier, thinking about how to do this with a brush is a simple matter of placing those same highlights in the same areas with a brush. I've used a slightly lighter mid-tone for this glaze. Let's move into our next layer of airbrushing and this step is all about re-adding saturation. So this is something you can do with a contrast paint which is something I've done in the past. It's also something you can do with uh, a slightly transparent color. Here, what I'm doing is I'm focusing this really intense color on the shadows, trying to leave a little bit of this color in those areas where it's lighter. But this step is all about re-adding the intensity of the color. Now, I think in, in a lot of ways, if you're watching this process and you're thinking, well, why don't you just leave the purple? Uh, why did you highlight all the way up to white when you're just gonna go back over it? It's a fair question. I guess the answer for me is all about contrast. When you have that underlying value shift, your model stands out a lot more on the table than if you were just to do a highlight up to this base purple. And ultimately what we want is for the figures to look great on the table and less about looking great in the painting desk. So you can see how much of a change we've made to the overall value of this cloak. It's now a much more purple color, more of a satin look almost. And that is purely because we've filtered this color with the airbrush. Now I want to continue that process here. I'm using a dark blue and I'm mixing that in with a little bit of the purple. I just want to continue to darken the color, adding more bluish tones to contrast with the warmer magenta colors. Each of these layers on the airbrush is really dilute. It's not completely changing the color. It's not overlaying with a whole new color. It's a much lighter, softer version. So here I am going in after doing our airbrush glazes and I am going to do our final highlights you can see I started work on some of those other elements. It's an important part that I've talked about in previous episodes. Seeing each volume alongside a more finished volume is crucial. This step is just continuing to re-add some intensity of light. It's going to add a little bit of texture, a little bit of interest in the fabric. And again, just reinforce the shape of the light and the shape of these volumes. This step's probably not necessary for 
the majority of volumes. But I really think that with fabric, you want it to feel smooth and interesting. And this step uh, helps add a little bit more light and intensity of highlight. I think the value of the airbrush and the value of glazing is most evident here on these transitions. You can see what were rough and sketchy brush strokes with some smoothness are now ultra smooth, lots of interesting nuance of color and popping these little highlights on with this slightly higher value color is creating a really dynamic and interesting looking fabric. It's one of the most unique surfaces to paint and when you start to find your way with how you want to paint fabric, cloaks, all sorts of different shapes just become an exciting opportunity to do something with big expressive brush strokes. It's one of my most challenging surfaces that I've had to learn to paint. And I think that would probably be the case for many painters. But when you start to find your way of doing it, it is a real joy to see how fabric looks as a final result. Each of these final highlights is just about adding that extra pop, that extra bit of light and a little bit of texture and interest. On a lot of the other figures, I've added some weathering, some dirty elements down the base of the fabric. In this instance, again, I didn't want to, I wanted it to remain smooth and interesting. And this is the final result. This brings to a close this episode of Painting Art Sworn with the topic of fabric and cloaks. Now, painting cloaks can be done without an airbrush and it is still a relatively simple process. It just takes a little bit more time. I highly recommend getting an airbrush if you haven't got one, purely so you can do really cool tricks like I did in this episode. In the next episode, we are going to focus on painting steel and steel comes in a variety of shapes weapons, armor, of course, the more obvious ones. But we'll also look at some different types of steel that you can find from polished, refined steel to rusty, old metal. And for that, our subject matter will be the penitent. I am super pumped. Can't wait to see you on the next episode. Big General. Arr.